Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the something of something, uh, we'll say the 26th of July, 2020. And I know what you're thinking, uh, John shrunk. It's not, I just got a brand new monitor. So I've replaced my 55 inch Dell with a 75 inch. So I'm very, very excited. Also, my wife bought me this shirt this week. She saw it on Facebook and thought it was hysterical. So there you go. So changes this week. Um, I did post two videos yesterday. Um, I did a kind of Azure virtual WAN overview. It's just under 20 minutes going through the key kind of connectivities that provides. Then it was really a joke. I was testing the new monitor set up in the lights. I tried to describe Azure AD in 60 seconds. Um, so that's kind of there as well. So new capabilities. So Azure AD has actually added a fairly interesting capability around this new My Staff. So this is actually built on administrative units. So if you think about ordinarily with kind of Azure AD, we have the idea where well, we have this Azure AD object, and I can have lots of users in that Azure AD. But there is no structure, there's no like organizational units that we have in Active Directory. So what administrative units do is I can now create this administrative unit and I can put people in that administrative unit. A member can be a member of lots of different administrative units. And then I can grant particular people a role. So I can do a particular role, just scope to that administrative unit. So for example, I say, hey, you, you can reset passwords for all the people in that particular administrative unit. So it's given me the ability to now give someone a constrained, a delegated set of permissions to a subset of Azure AD. So that's kind of the new capability of administrative units. There's now a new portal. So I can actually go to mystaff.microsoft.com and as maybe like I'm a branch officer, I'm an admin for a local team, it gives me a much simplified interface to actually go and manage my people, go and reset their passwords. So it gives me that simpler experience. So if I actually super quickly jump over, so from here I can go into user settings, manage user feature preview settings, and then I can turn on that administrators can access my staff for none, selected or all. And then once you have done that, if I'm actually using the administrative unit capabilities, you can see I've got this Justice League administrative unit. I've got users in there and I've granted the help desk administrator role to Clark Kent. So now if I'm Clark Kent and I go to that mystaff.microsoft.com, if I go and look at the members of the Justice League, well, I can actually now go and reset their passwords. I can do those basic things. So I can just kind of select a user. And then from here, I could reset Barry's password. So it gives me that kind of simpler experience. If I don't have permission and I try and go to a different administrative unit, I, I can't do anything. I cannot reset those passwords. I don't have the permission. So we can see it's giving us that nice experience if I just need to do some very basic management for people kind of at my office. So that is the new um, kind of my stuff. It's in preview, so you have to go and turn that on. On the Azure Compute side, uh, Container D is now supported for the Azure Kubernetes service. So if you think about, we have these container runtimes. And today what we have is you can think about on the host, this is the worker node, I kind of have the kubelet. So the kubelet is responsible for going and actually talking to the Kubernetes management infrastructure, the, sorry, the, the API service. And now today the way it actually works is there's this kind of, the kubelet talks to this Docker shim and that Docker shim actually runs on the Docker engine. That was strange. <laughs> Docker shim. That then goes and talks to kind of this Mobi project. And then within the Mobi project, it runs that container D. 
and then it goes and actually talks to the various pods um, through the regular the OCI. There's lots of little hops there. So what's changing is now with the native container D, all of these parts kind of just go away. The cubelet now will just go and talk directly to container D and these parts just go away. So it's going to use this new um, container runtime interface, the CRI, to just go and talk directly to container D. Now today it's in preview and I can go and create new um, AKS instances from the work and the node pools to use container D. In the future, everything will move to this. So once this gets into GA, everything will just start in to use container D. It won't use that Mobi anymore, um, that Docker shim, the, the Docker runtime for that. Obviously, the benefit of that, I should have stressed, is it's going to be lower latency. There's less hops, less components. There's going to be a slightly smaller resource use on your worker nodes. Um, for the Azure Kubernetes service, I can now bring my own managed identity. So with AKS, it has to have permissions to Azure to go and create um, load balancers, for example. And so it uses either a service principal or a system assigned managed identity. Well, now I can actually do a user assigned. I can bring my own managed identity to my Kubernetes cluster. So it gives me a bit more flexibility. I can create the managed identity in advance, give it whatever permissions it needs, and then use it when I go and spin up my AKS. On the networking side, um, App Gateway now supports URL rewrite and wildcard host names. So for the URL rewrite, I could have a name coming in, let's say savletech.com. Well, I could actually rewrite that to now point to www.savletech.net slash path with these header kind of variables passed through. I can really translate anything that comes in to anything I want on the other side. On the wildcard, yes, as we kind of would expect, I can absolutely kind of do um, like star asterisk dot savletech.net. So that would take anything I put in that component. But I can also use question mark. So I could have like Savile Tech dash question mark question mark dot com. So that could actually be Savile Tech dash 10 dash 11 dash 12. So wildcard, the asterisk is kind of unlimited characters within that segment. The question mark is one character. So it wildcards a single character. So I can now use that as actually part of my app gateway configurations for those, those rules. On the storage side, Azure Files NFS 4.1 has gone into private preview. This is private preview. I have to go and sign up for this. Um, you may have heard about NFS 3 is available for blob storage if I have the, uh, the hierarchical namespace turned on, like the Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. But that's NFS 3. Um, NFS 4 was kind of like a rewrite. It introduced things about state and locking, really make it more comparable to SMB 3, that enterprise kind of protocol with state and locking and those things. So this is gonna be on an Azure Premium file share type. Um, I pick, so I create a share, that share will be created as SMB or NFS. The initial release, um, I'm going to be use UID, GID, kind of apples. It won't support Kerberos uh, at launch time. It will have encryption in transit at GA. Um, I'll be able to bring my own key at GA. So it's going to have like a, a nice NFS 4.1 capability. Miscellaneous. So Windows Virtual Desktop now has this enterprise scale guidance. And this is when we start thinking about more than a thousand desktops. So what this is really coming as is if you think about it, there are certain limitations I can have when I, I create these deployments. So what this new model actually does is it thinks about, well, I have kind of this hub virtual network with most of the components in it, but I can then create additional subscriptions with their own VNet where I deploy desktops to and then peer that to my main hub. 
So there's this very specific guidance on exactly how I can think about deploying out these very large scale uh, Windows virtual desktop environments. Azure Stack HCI V2. So this is the hyper-converged infrastructure. And we had a HCI V1. The HCI V1 was very much a, hey, there, there's Windows Server 2016, there's Hyper-V, there's Storage Spaces Direct, and there's the kind of Windows Admin Center. That was HCI V1. So what I've really done with V2 is it's now part of that wider real Azure Stack portfolio, Azure Stack Hub, the big turnkey appliance, Azure Stack Edge, kind of one or maybe two boxes giving me edge compute, FPGAs, GPUs. And that is Azure Stack HCI v2. It is now a purpose-built product. So it's built on Windows Server 2019, but it actually takes advancements to Hyper-V from Azure and will bring it to this purpose-built operating system. It's going to integrate with the Azure portal. It's going to have Azure Arc. So it's going to bring me that kind of Kubernetes management, the VM management, those Azure data service. And it is still hyper-converged. What that means is essentially it's taking the hyper-converged nature. So with hyper-converged, we kind of think about, well, okay, I have a box and it has local storage, and I have another box and it has local storage. And what hyper-converged is it takes that local storage and kind of brings it together to be seen as some shared storage. So this cluster sees it takes that local storage, it replicates between them, and it makes it this kind of shared storage that it can use. So this is storage spaces direct, S2D. Now what it actually supports is a stretched cluster. So I can think about this is at one location, and then in another location, I really have exactly the same thing again. I have this hyper-converged set of infrastructure. It's a different site. Once again, I'll take the local volumes from the cluster nodes at that site and create this cluster shared volume. So once again, I'm using storage space direct. But now it will actually use storage replica to either synchronously or asynchronously replicate the content to the other set of hyper-converged storage. So I'm now gonna stretch my cluster between sites. I can do that in Windows Server 2019. And that's what this HVI v2. So this hyper-converged infrastructure v2 is gonna give me those capabilities. It's gonna natively integrate with Azure Site Recovery and backup and monitoring and update management. Um, plus, if I deploy to Azure State Hub today or Azure today, I get extended security patch support for Windows Server 2008. That will apply to this solution as well. So if I have those 2008 boxes still roaming around, if I run them on the Azure Stack HCI v2, they'll get that extended security um, update support for those critical patches. There's this new Azure well-architected framework available, and it's actually pretty interesting. So if we go and actually look at this, it's a set of guidance about things to think about if you want a well-architected framework. There's these five key pillars. It talks about cost optimization, operational excellence, performance, efficiency, reliability, security. So it walks through, there's all this documentation, but it's actually a really nice kind of free training course as well you can take. So it all links from this document. Up. If you go and look at the description, the YouTube video, I'll have this here. You can go and read the documentation, you can go and take the training, and it's really just about helping you create better architectures on Azure and how I can stay up to date. There's kind of an assessment I can run through for a certain deployment, answer some questions, and it will help guide me. It's like, well, maybe you've missed this consideration, or are you thinking of this, to help make sure it really is as well architected as it could possibly be. So definitely kind of worth a look. Reserved capacity is now available for Postgres um, hyperscale. So hyperscale is the ability to kind of shard multiple um, nodes for my database. And we might be used to this reserved capacity. We think about reserved instances for virtual machines, but this really expanded. There's now huge numbers of services that I can actually reserve capacity for. And the whole point of the reserved capacity 
is it's just like kind of staying in a hotel. If I show up at a hotel and I stay there for three nights, I pay X amount of money. But if I phone them up in advance, say, I'm going to stay at your hotel for two months. They give me a much cheaper rate for that. Now, if I don't stay in that room for a night or two in that time period, I still pay for the room. So that's what the kind of reserved capacity does. So the way I use reserve capacity is if I know I have a certain steady state, I always need this base amount, then I'll use kind of that reserve capacity. I'll do that. But anything that's variable, I won't use reserved because again, reserved, I pay for it if I'm using it or not. So the additional maybe variation in capacity, that kind of I'll still do pay as you go. But I can use that reserved pricing for like a one or a three year term. I think for the Postgres, it's like 45% for one year and 65% for three years. So it's a big discount. So if I know I'm going to have a certain amount of requirement for a period of time, well, those reserved kind of instances make a lot of sense. But don't go above what you need. For the additional, hey, I'll just use the pay as you go for that. That's kind of the best way to really optimize your spend. Um, there's now an Azure Monitor Log Connector for Azure Logic Apps and Power Automate. So Power Automate uh, builds on top of Logic Apps. Logic Apps gives me this kind of flow based, this component talks to this component, etc. Or it can now actually hook into Azure Monitor Logs. So I think a log could come in through one of these flows. You could then maybe go and email someone or do something else. So that's it for this week. Um, I hope that was useful as always if it was. Um, please like, please subscribe, please share, please comment. And uh, until next week, take care.